Last week, countries at the United Nations voted for the organization to take a greater role in international tax matters. The move is perceived as a threat to the ascendancy of the OECD, the body that has led these discussions for decades. Countries at the UN adopted a resolution to begin the process of establishing a framework convention on tax and completely change how global tax rules are decided. The resolution was led primarily by African member states and could eventually move decision-making on global tax rules from the OECD, a club of developed countries, to the UN. Let's get more on this from Alex Cobham. He is the chief executive of the Tax Justice Network. Welcome to DW, Alex. Why are you so confident that developing countries will benefit from this move? Well, look, we, we have a position in international tax where pretty much every country loses significant amounts uh, every year to cross-border tax abuse by both multinational companies and individuals hiding their assets and income streams offshore. And we've estimated that cost the world about $480 billion a year, call it half a trillion. Now, the larger part of that is lost by OECD members, the rich countries themselves, but as a share of current tax revenues, it's much bigger, much more intense, those losses for lower income countries. So the same countries that don't have a voice within the OECD, which has been setting the tax rules for about 60 years, are the countries that lose out in the way that's most damaging. Um, so they lose almost, on average, almost 50% of their public health budgets compared to perhaps 9 or 10% in the high income countries. So that's why it's really important that this is a step on the way to lower income countries having an equal say in setting the rules. That doesn't mean we'll get to a perfect solution, but it certainly right. means there's a lot of space uh, for all countries to, to be much better off. Alex, let's take a closer look at this agreement. The two-track deal aims to create a 15% global minimum corporate tax rate and calls for a new treaty that would shift some taxing rights on the most profitable uh, multinationals to countries where the company's clients are located. Now, how likely is it that these plans will become reality? So it's not terribly likely, but that's nothing to do with what's happened at the United Nations. That's purely because the OECD, the two pillars, have really lost so much of their ambition. So that pillar one was originally designed to, to really make profit shifting almost impossible. In the most ambitious version, it would have required all of the profits of multinational companies to be declared and taxed in the same places that they're carrying out their real economic activity. So that would stop you shifting profits into places like the Netherlands or Ireland or Luxembourg, you know, away from the places that the companies are actually making their money. But that's collapsed now. So what's left is a bit of um, a bit of alignment of profit with activity that applies only to a small fraction of the profits of fewer than 100 of the largest multinationals. All other profits remain under the old rules, arm's length pricing that we know don't work. So that one's gone. And on top of that, the United States has signaled that they won't be able to ratify. And the rules, as, as the OECD has written them, means that that means nobody else can move ahead with this either. So pillar one is pretty much dead. And that's, that's just the OECD um, doing that. Mm. Pillar two, the minimum tax, as you say, in theory, that would apply a rate of 15 percent, very low, but much better than the kind of zero or, or five percent, perhaps, that the companies often pay in those European tax havens like the Netherlands, like Luxembourg. So it feels like a step forward. But actually, when you look at the detail, as people now have, the way that this has evolved um, in the last couple of years again, it's lost a great deal of its ambition. So what we see now is the revenue gains are going to be much lower than the OECD originally projected. And on top of that, most of them will be captured by those corporate tax havens, those profit shifting jurisdictions. So those are the ones that are most, uh, most excitedly embracing this. You know, we see Switzerland and its, its different cantons competing with each other to see how they can get the most out of this. For most other countries, they can continue suffering profit shifting just as they have done uh, up till now. And that's why really countries are looking to the United Nations to see if we can find a better way, a better way Alex, forward instead. 
Alex, against the backdrop that, that, that you just outlined there, that, that things are very complicated and there's different players on different levels competing with each other, uh, working against each other in, in, in many cases. Now, could giving the UN more of a role here on the global tax stage make the situation uh, more effective, more streamlined or even more bureaucratic? Well, look, you know, as I say, the OECD has been in charge of this area for about 60 years, and they've been working on the current set of reforms for 10 years since the G20 gave them a single goal, which was to reduce the misalignment between where profits are declared by multinationals and where those multinationals have their real economic activity. It's fair to say all the evidence we have suggests that the OECD has failed. The scale of corporate tax abuse, as far as we can track it, has got bigger and bigger over that period. So I think right, Alex, but is the UN now, likely to play a better role? Is the UN likely to pay, play a better role then, if the OECD has failed in your so that's, words? So that's the key question. Right. So the question we need to start with is why has the OECD failed? And there's really two reasons. The first is that it's exclusionary, right? It only gives an effective voice to its own members and actually even probably only to the biggest ones of them. The second reason it's failed is because its process is really not designed for a global negotiation. It happens behind closed doors. There's no vote, there's no rules of procedure, and there's no transparency. That means that our governments in the OECD countries can walk in saying to the public, we are really serious about ending corporate tax abuse. And then they get behind closed doors and actually they've been lobbied by their own multinationals and they say, no, we're, we're gonna block any progress. If we move this to the United Nations, the same as we do with international trade, climate change, a lot of other negotiations, we're immediately into a different kind of space. One in which every country has a voice and one in which the citizens of every country can see what their government is doing with that voice. And that doesn't guarantee that we get an answer, but it certainly strips out a lot of the potential for the smoky, uh, smoky room closed door lobbying that we get at the OECD. And at least it gives us a chance for a genuinely globally inclusive democratic process to set tax rules that could benefit all of us. But, but, but again, Alex, uh, be that as it may, that, you know, there may be more transparency. I mean, behind the doors of the UN, I think there's also strong lobbying going on. But, you know, given that there may be more transparency, is the UN the right body to implement effective tax reform? Yeah, I mean, this is something we hear from the OECD is this claim that the UN doesn't have capacity on tax is actually completely untrue. You know, we've seen the UN Tax Committee, for example, bring forward model treaty articles within the last couple of years that deal precisely with the problems that the OECD is currently failing to deal with in terms of highly digitalized uh, multinationals. So we know the OECD process it has a lot more resources, but the UN has actually already shown itself to be more effective in finding solutions. If we move to a position where the UN actually also has more resources, I think there's good reason to be optimistic that this body can find a solution that pretty much benefits all of us, except the, uh, the lobbyists for corporate tax abuse. What kind of uh, enforcement of global tax rules is aimed for then? Well, look, we don't really have enforcement as things stand other than by kind of political coercion and suasion. With a UN uh, convention, the possibility is that you'd, you'd be able to set standards that would legitimately be agreed among all countries. So rather than having these kind of blacklists like the, the European Union has that single out typically very poor and small countries like Namibia and fail to address major tax havens like the United States or EU member states like the Netherlands, you'd have these standards agreed by everyone. And that would give you the basis to take some kind of countermeasures legitimately against jurisdictions that insisted on providing financial secrecy, insisted on facilitating profit shifting in a way that we don't really have legitimacy for that today. But I guess on top of that, you know, the difference is that you'd have the potential 
to move forward in a way that really generates revenue benefits for everyone. And that on its own creates a lot of buy-in. If governments can say to their people, we are reducing the revenue losses from corporate tax abuse, from individuals hiding their assets offshore, that gives you a lot of political goodwill to move forward and to make sure that the, the bad guys, if you like, are being required to play the game too. Alex Cobham, Chief Executive of the Tax Justice Network. Alex, thank you very much for your time.